Hello, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 6 from OpenStax Astronomy. Chapter 6 is about astronomical instruments, basically telescopes, but not just visible light telescopes. Okay, so let's talk, talk about or start talking about one of the most famous telescopes of them all, the HST, which stands for the Hubble Space Telescope. This telescope has been instrumental in common knowledge about astronomy. Most of the pictures that are well known on the internet of galaxies and nebula and, and stars for that matter are all taken by this Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, this telescope is in orbit around Earth at a fairly low altitude in terms of, of orbits, about 400 kilometers above the surface of Earth, but it's up in space above the atmosphere. All right. Now, when we look up into space, as we've talked about in previous chapters, we can look at space in a number of different ways. We can look at visible light and see the stars that show up within that spectrum of the overall electromagnetic spectrum, and that is between 400 to 700 nanometers. Okay, that's the visible light spectrum. That's going to show us the blue stars and red stars, all those visible stars. We can also look in the X-ray spectrum, and we can look at the light that is coming that is very high energy light, because X-rays, just like they're used in the medical field, are very high energy types of light. And high energy phenomena like stars with the fusion that's going on inside of them, well, they're producing X-rays. So we can see that X-ray signature coming from X-ray sources, whether those are you know, um, white dwarfs that are being fed on by black holes, whether those are neutron stars, whether those are just large stars themselves that are in their death throes, whatever the phenomenon, there are lots of types of X-ray sources. We can also look at infrared, and notice we're looking at the same part of the sky in each case, the Orion Nebula, and we can look at the infrared spectrum. We can see essentially the heat signature or what we would associate with everyday heat here on Earth because infrared light is gonna be light that is less than 400 nanometers, okay? Or, excuse me, greater than 700 nanometers, all right? It's not less, it's greater because the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. So infrared light is greater, this is the infrared, right? This is a longer wavelength light, lower energy light. Infrared is used for remote controls. I talked about this in the previous chapter, but infrared light is also associated with temperatures of say body temperature, associated with the temperatures that are emitted by objects on the surface of Earth or just other planets in general, the surface of planets. But that type of light is also synonymous with nebula. It is the type of light that's coming off of dust grains, tiny dust grains that make up large clouds. By large, I mean many light years across that stretch across the galaxy. And so these large nebulas are emitting infrared light. Infrared light also passes through clouds that would otherwise obscure visible light. So it allows us to see behind basically these dark clouds, behind walls in, a, in an essence that we otherwise could not see behind. All right, but the point being is we're seeing the same portion of the sky in different types of the EM spectrum. All right, very much tied into the physics that we discussed in the last chapter in chapter five, all about why light is the way it is, why there are different types of electromagnetic spectrum and so on. But here we're talking about what astronomers do to observe these different parts of the EM spectrum. Okay, so people have been interested in the sky for as long as humans have been alive, we look up into the sky and we're fascinated by this world that is right there looking at us all the time, but is inaccessible, that we can't reach, that we can't actually access. What does it mean? What's the significance of it? Well, for millennia, humans had no other way to look at the night sky other than with their own unaided eyes. But we could still collect data about the movement of stars throughout the year. Of course, that's due to Earth's movement around the sun. We could track that. We could align stones with certain phenomenon in the sky. Okay, But since about the 1500s onwards, we've been able to use telescopes. Telescopes are based on glass or other materials, but transparent lenses that allow us to focus light, all right? Every lens in an ideal situation, so a simplification of a lens, has a particular curvature, 
right, as shown here, that allows for a focal point to be created at a fixed focal length, all right, F for the focal length. In other words, every lens ideally is defined by its focal length. The focal length is where the light will be focused. This type of lens is called a converging lens because it allows incoming parallel rays of light to get converged on a single focal point. There are also diverging lenses that cause incoming parallel rays to diverge instead, creating a virtual image instead of, in this case, a real image. Because the light, the actual photons, as we discussed in chapter five, are actually passing through this point. So if we were to say, put a piece of paper or photoactive paper, photoactive material, or maybe a CCD that we'll discuss later in this lecture, if we were to put that at that focus, that focal point, then we'd actually be able to resolve an image, okay? That's what lenses do in that idea of forming an image with a simple lens, specifically a converging simple lens, okay? Now, a very, very basic and most ancient type of telescope, and this of course is about 500 years that since telescopes have been first developed, is a refracting telescope, all right? So a refractor is a type of telescope, and it's based on the idea that there is a converging optical lens and a second converging eyepiece. That allows an image to be formed that the human eye can see when they look through the eyepiece. Many hobby telescopes to today are refractors. They are refracting telescopes. But refractors have major limitations because they have to be very long. The longer the telescope, the better the resolving powder, power, okay? Also, they're not going to be able to, to, to actually pick up very dim objects because they're never going to be that large because if they have to have a very large diameter, so a diameter here, they would have to have both a large diameter and a long length, a engineering difficulty. On the other hand, we have reflectors or reflecting telescopes. These are not constrained by their length. In other words, they don't have better magnification, all right, because here, I, I should have said that more clearly a moment ago, but talking about the refracting telescope, it's the magnification that's controlled by the length. So as the length goes up, the magnification also goes up. Not true, M for magnification, not true for the reflector. The reflector is not constrained by its length. It can get very high magnification based on basically other parameters, all right? And it can get that better resolving power because it can have a much larger diameter. It can be engineered to have a much larger diameter. So the idea here is that resolving power, R for resolving power, goes up as diameter goes up, okay? So here we have that the reflector or the reflecting telescope can have that much greater resolving power. In other words, it can let in a lot more starlight. Notice how much bigger it is, okay? That's, no, that's not just you know, coincidence that this, this reflector is drawn as wider than the re refractor, okay? Because it is, it allows more light to come in. They're sometimes called light buckets because they're just letting, they're just collecting so much light, they're letting it pour in. That's great for dim objects. So most modern telescopes are reflectors. There's just more engineering possibilities in this type of telescope, all right? So this is the telescope that we'll pay more attention to in terms of light telescopes. Okay, so discussing a little bit more about reflecting telescopes, we have the primary focus. This is a mirror, a curved mirror. The curved mirror, much like the converging lens we saw in the refractor case here, the basic principle of forming an image, well, the curved mirror also forms an image, okay? That image is then reflected off a secondary mirror called a Newtonian focus. This is just a angled mirror. And then that is then passed through an eyepiece and then observed, right? So here is our observer. On the other hand, we can also have a Cassegrain focus where the mirror is not curved, the secondary mirror, and instead there is a gap in the primary mirror which allows the eyepiece to be placed here and the observer just looks through the end. Both of these are designed, there's pros and cons to both. All right, here's an example of that Cassegrain focus, because we can see there is a gap in the center of this huge mirror, okay? 
This mirror here um, is the Yepen, is the name of it, and it is about eight meters across, which is about 24 feet across, eight meters in its, in its diameter, or about four meters in its radius. This is a huge mirror, very, very carefully engineered, because there can't be in, any imperfections in this mirror if we're trying to look at tiny, faint objects such as distant stars, or the planets around distant stars, or distant galaxies, whatever it may be, whatever faint object astronomers are interested, at, interested in observing and trying to understand, it's so important to see small, high magnification, but also to resolve very faint, dim objects, which is high resolution. All right, so here are some modern reflecting telescopes. We can see their construction with the very large mirrors, and the way that they're gonna let light come in by opening up some door in nighttime when the conditions are right, letting that light come down through and then collecting it with a computer and then analyzing the results, all right? So another way to build those large mirrors instead of just having one very carefully engineered flat mirror is instead to make hexes and then place them together. Of course, this has the limitation that these hexes must come together with very almost perfect precision on the edges, or at least a way for computers to compensate for what are those disruptions in the edges of the hexes, okay? So computer processing has been very integral in making this type of design more practical because first of all, it's, it's easier to engineer a number of hexes and then, and then essentially glue them together, very carefully place them together, and then compensate for whatever whatever you know, disturbance that creates because we know exactly where those lines are, all right? But again, processing power is very important for making these telescopes as useful as they are today. All right, in this case, this is the 10 meters, so even larger, over 30 feet in diameter Keck telescope composed of 36 hexagonal sections, all right? Now, in terms of the history of these large telescopes, we can appreciate Hale, George Hale, who lived from 1868 to 1938, and whose um, progress in engineering made it possible to build um, large telescopes at the time, which were refracting telescopes, but were the the mod, you know at that time the cutting edge telescopes of astronomy. Here is today a large refracting telescope. In fact, the largest one that is in use at 40 inches or one meter. All right, so that is a 40 inch focal length is you can see it is an incredibly long telescope and that's why we don't see that many of this design they're just not practical there's too many imperfections that can happen in terms of trying to engineer this column so it doesn't buckle under its own weight it's it's just it there's just so much more that can be done with a design like this right in terms of the actual structural support to build a, ref, a reflecting um, apparatus like this this telescope shown here as composed as opposed to making this work, right? So we just don't see too many refracting telescopes used today, but there are still some. And it is interesting to think about, you know, what their limitations are. And of course, the biggest one is interesting in, in its own right. So one thing that has been at the forefront of this, this, this discussion that I've been going over in the last few slides, discussing, discussing how we have these different types of reflecting telescopes for the most part, looking at particular examples, is these all exist on the surface of Earth, except for, of course, our first image where we started with the Hubble telescope. Well, the Hubble telescope is up in outer space. So why is the Hubble telescope in outer space and these other telescopes are on the surface of Earth? Well, you can imagine, first of all, it's much less expensive, still expensive, but much less expensive to build a huge telescope, here's a person for scale, on the surface of Earth because you can access it and maintain it, okay? You don't have to launch it into space on a rocket. So having, you know, or, you know ground-based telescopes are, of course, 99% of the telescopes that exist. But there's a huge limitation to having telescopes on the surface of Earth because that means that you have to look up through Earth's atmosphere. And Earth's atmosphere distorts whatever type of very faint, very small object you are trying to observe as an astronomer. So the best Earth-based telescopes are in high and dry locations. High because there's less atmosphere to look through. Dry because there's less water molecules in the atmosphere to obscure or blur the image. Okay, so high deserts are the ideal conditions 
for telescopes. You'll hear about telescopes that exist in the high deserts of Chile. That's no coincidence. That's a very particularly good location for telescopes, okay? So here is an actual image taken of Jupiter from an, a ground-based on Earth telescope. You can see it's pretty pretty incredibly detailed. We can see the storms in, in um, Jupiter's clouds, their upper, uh, you know, the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. We can see the bands due to um, the, the, um, the particular wind structure on Jupiter. And this was taken from an Earth-based telescope, the very large telescope in Chile. Why in Chile? Because that is a high and dry desert. Those are the right conditions for an image like this to be possible. Now, we're not just using mirrors and eyepieces in the human eye. We're actually collecting those images on charged coupled devices. This is so crucial to getting higher resolution, higher amounts of actual light that's coming in. Because if you think about how much light actually passes into or onto a photographic plate because up until we had CCDs, how besides just you know looking with the human eye and and ob ob observing or recording what we what we saw with our own eye, how would we actually permanently save these images? Well, we'd put them onto a photographic plate. We put them onto you know some sort of you know actual like you know image onto you know a roll of of, of photos or you know even a Polaroid, however you want to think about it, some chemically activated photographic paper, all right? Well, that only picks up a certain number of photons that actually pass through the telescope. Sometimes only 1% to 6% of the photons that are passing through the telescope in the case of a photo. But if we're using a computer and a CCD, we're able to get much higher amounts of actual captured light, something on the range to 60% to 90% of the light that's passing through the telescope can get collected by these digital sensors, all right? So big innovation there, big progress in astronomy. And of course, these progresses in astronomy are just, just continuing every day, every year, and we're just getting better, better and better engineering breakthroughs. Now, up to this point in this lecture, we've been primarily talking about looking at telescopes as devices that pick up visible light. Okay, now we started with the idea that we can also look at X-rays. When we're looking at the Ryan Nebula, we can also look at infrared light, you know, from the Orion Nebula or any portion of the sky, but now we're going to talk about that in some more detail. Specifically, let's talk about infrared eyes. So this person here, this guy, we look at him and we see him in the visible spectrum and we can't see his hands because they're behind a black garbage bag. But if we look at him in the infrared spectrum, we can see his, his hands glowing through the garbage bag. That's because they're warmer than the garbage bag. They're emitting bright light. That light is able to pass through the bag. OK, so a couple things to observe to, you know, kind of take into account here. One is that we're able to see something that would otherwise be invisible. OK, that's the idea that we're able to see behind the bag. That's important for astronomy because that allows us to see primordial solar systems within nebula where no visible light can pass out of them. So this idea of infrared is so important for astronomy. Now, what's interesting about astro about infrared is also that it's, it has its own hurdles for detection. Because yes, we do want to see things. Astronomers want to be able to see the otherwise invisible. They want to be able to see behind the bag, so to speak. But that, as I said, comes with its own hurdles. One is that this infrared light is around us all the time. So if a infrared detector, an infrared telescope is built, it's going to be surrounded by light. It'd be like trying to use a telescope during the day. You can't see the stars during the day because they're washed out by the glowing atmosphere and the sunlight. Same thing here. You can't see infrared sources because they're washed out by all the other ground-based infrared sources. The telescope itself is emitting infrared light because it, the molecules in it are vibrating at such a frequency that they emit infrared light. That means the telescope must be cooled to very low temperatures so it doesn't emit light that it interferes with what it's trying to observe. Okay, that means that infrared telescopes must be very cold and ideally must be in space where they can be very cold and not just pick up a lot of ice. Okay, now one thing in addition to considering infrared is just the idea that we want to split the incoming light from any source into its composite 
wavelengths. We want to take white light or light composed of many wavelengths and split it into particular wavelengths. And that's gonna happen with this idea of, of diffraction, or excuse me, refraction. This idea that different wavelengths of light are going to bend slightly different amounts inside a prism and thus separate. And then those separated wavelengths, such as red, green, and violet, will create their own images. So we can see particular colors, and then we can look at the, say, particular elements that are associated with those colors. We talked about how different atoms have a fingerprint in terms of the particular wavelength, wavelengths of light they produce. Well, this idea of taking a spectrometer would tell us what elements exist from a particular image. We can also look at the Doppler effect because we can look at a shift to a known wavelength. So this idea of splitting light into particular wavelengths through refraction is so important to astronomy. It's happening with visible light, it's happening with infrared light, it's happening across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We split light into its composite wavelengths, okay? Now, in addition to visible light and infrared light, we also have radio waves. Now, radio waves are another form of light, okay? This is long wavelength light. These are not radio waves in the sense of sound waves. Now you might think, oh, you turn on the radio, you hear it. Well, that's because the electromagnetic radiation is put into your radio, then that radio vibrates a mechanical speaker that creates a sound wave. But the radio wave that travels from transmitter to, to speaker, or you, at least amplifier, that is light. That's a form of EM radiation. It's only become sound waves at the point of the speaker, okay? So radio waves, a form of light, much lower energy, than visible light, low, even more lower energy than infrared light, okay? But radio waves are important for astronomer, astronomy. There are lots of types of sources in the galaxy and beyond the galaxy that produce radio waves that tell us about important astronomical phenomena. Now, what's interesting is it's been since the 1920s to 1930s that radio astronomy first started. So we're only going on about 100 years of radio astronomy as composed to almost 500 years of visible light astronomy. So it's a newer field of research, but a lot has happened in that time. One of the first people to discover radio astronomy was this individual, Jainsky, who had built a, basically just a radio antenna used for transmitting radio waves here on the sur surface of Earth and realized that he was picking up radio waves that were coming from a fixed point in the galaxy. And thus, radio astronomy was born, although it took a few, a few years, a few, couple decades, before it really caught on as a popular form of astronomy and a well-respected form of astronomy. So there are radio images that come from, for example, Cygnus A, which is a galaxy that is producing very fast, very incredibly fast, quickly accelerated electrons. And those quickly accelerated electrons actually produce radio waves. That's one source of radio waves. Also very cold gases produce radio waves. So again, important sources. Um, well, this idea of the cosmic microwave background radiation, this important ev evidence of the idea that there is one common origin to the entire universe, the Big Bang, that itself is a radio wave. It's a microwave, which is a, hi a slightly higher energy form than typical radio waves, but is still considered a radio wave. So you can see radio waves are so important to astronomy. Here we have a uh, radio wave telescope in, um, West Virginia, all right? This is the um, basically the second, or actually the current largest radio wave telescope, more on that in just a minute. But this, this large radio wave telescope you can see is, uh, is basically, doesn't look like a light telescope at all. It's just a large dish, right? Because the way radio, wave, radio waves work is we're gonna collect them because they're much longer wavelength as, as opposed to visible light. We're not collecting them with, with small glass prisms or you know small glass lenses or even mirrors. Instead, we collect them with large dishes, all right? And then we just use that shape to focus the light, right? And we focus the light up to a sensor. So we have a concave, right? Essentially a lens, but a lens that is just a large dish and then reflects those radio waves, that light, back up to a particular sensor that's then fed into a computer, okay? So radio waves work on the same principle as a mirror, right? Because essentially it's a reflecting surface, but it doesn't have to be as, as, as you know, fine detail. The, the mirror in this case is just a huge grid that, you know, to, that is made on a much, much larger scale because of the much long, longer wavelength. OK. Now, radio waves are also interesting because you can then get together data 
from multiple radio wave telescopes. You can create this idea of an interferometer. So an interferometer, because multiple radio wave telescopes can all communicate with each other and can all look at the same source. So if they're all looking at the same source of light, they're all pointing in the same direction, as that light comes in, each telescope will have a slightly different signal because it will be a slightly different distance from the source. And then that interference between all the dishes can be calculated with a computer to create higher resolution of the image than from a single telescope. So this idea of having multiple radio telescopes all operating together makes for much higher resolution than otherwise would be possible for radio waves. Because since radio waves are so long, inherently observing them would, would have very low resolution. But by being able to create this interferometer, we can actually get that resolution down and be able to pinpoint the exact location and exact wavelength that we're looking at. Now, up until recently, when we built these large arrays like this one, the ALMA array in northern Chile, again, high desert, all right? Same reason for radio waves. You want to have as little atmosphere as possible for the waves to pass through, just like with visible light. But up until recently, these, those telescopes had to be connected to each other with hard wires because of limitations of actually sending distant you know, data over, say, the internet or through satellites. But of course, in the last few decades, we've been able to communicate with high you know, high amount, high bandwidth data across very vast distances. So now, for example, the United States runs an array of radio telescopes that stretches from Hawaii all the way to, um, I, I guess that would be in not Puerto Rico or um, nah, near Puerto Rico. But the point being that we have this incredible resolution. We have a very large baseline, which is going to be this effective size of this radio telescope. Okay, this idea then that this large baseline, as the baseline goes up, the resolution also goes up. We're able to see smaller and smaller things that produce radio waves and be able to get higher and higher, um, you know, quality images, you know, ver you know, images created out of these radio waves. Because when I say images, I, we create these artificial images. For example, this is not a real image. There's no yellow source of light here. These, these are colors that match different wavelengths of radio waves. They're artificially colored so we can make sense of the data. Right. But the quality of this image, if you think about it, if we had if we didn't have such a large array, this would this would be a very pixelated image. But the fact that this is not so pixelated is a testament to having this large baseline. OK. Now, the largest radio um, uh, basically detector that existed that was also used as a radar dish was that of the Arecibo Observatory. But um, just over a year ago, it actually collapsed. It had, been in, um, it had been in need of a repair. There was um, a kind of a lack of funding to do so. This, this one was based in Puerto Rico, and it actually completely collapsed in a, a catastrophic um, failure. It, the cables broke. This entire apparatus fell down, crashing through the disk, and is completely destroyed with no plans to repair it. So its long legacy has come to an end. It was a thousand foot um, radio dish. So again, you know, like for picking up radio waves, but it is, it is now done. It's, you know, it's, it's time for scientific use has come to an end, which is, um, which is sad, but also just, you know, has its own, you know, kind of implications outside of astronomy. Now, what is, what is interesting, um, when this, when this dish was in operation, it was not just a radio observatory. It wasn't just for picking up uh, radio waves from outer space, it was also used for radar. So it would it would transmit radio waves, have them bounce off of things within the own solar system, and then get the, the signal back. And then based on how long that signal took, it could then measure the distance to those objects within the solar system. And it could also measure the Doppler effect for, um, to get the current instantaneous velocity of whatever that radio wave is getting bounced off of. Now, that only really works for um, object, objects within, the, within our own solar system, because if we would try to send a radio wave outside of the solar system, say to even the nearest star, that would be a three-year transit time to get there three years back. It wouldn't be practical to actually bounce something off, you know, off of a source so far away because that's six years of total time, because it's three light years away, the nearest star. 
That said, the idea of a radar dish for locating things in the solar system at this high resolution because of the large baseline is incredibly important because there are a lot of things within our own solar system that we are still very carefully measuring distances to because we need to understand our own solar system in detail, whether that's to track, you know, asteroids that could be on a collision path for Earth or just to better understand, you know, where we're going to go and explore and perhaps mine asteroids or go or go to the moons of Jupiter, whatever that may be. We need to know the precise locations of things in our solar system. And this here giant radio dish was very useful for that. Okay. Now, there are plans to build another, even larger radio dish in China, but it is not yet completed. So, we can, so we're currently at a point in astronomy where the world's largest radio dish recently was destroyed, and we don't have one. Now, in terms of getting up out of the atmosphere, something we've, we've hinted at for a while in this lecture, we can get up into the upper atmosphere, even above the high deserts of Chile or any other high desert, by actually putting a telescope, in this case, a radio dish or an infrared. And this one's actually an infra, used for infrared astronomy. It looks like a radio dish, but it's used for long wavelength infra, um, in, infrared astronomy in an airplane. Okay. And so actually flying it up at very high altitudes, about as high as this airplane can fly, a, a modified, um, you know, just passenger jet and actually doing astronomy up there um, above about 99% of the atmosphere. So almost in space. Okay. Or we can actually, you know, go into space itself. Right, so we can send. Um, this is the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope, um, which is actually uh, taking images in the X-ray spectrum. All right, so this is a um, this is a telescope up in space. All right, um, actually, excuse me, um, X-ray will come next. So excuse the mistake. The Spitzer Space Telescope actually takes images in the infrared. All right, so it's another it's another infrared telescope, just like the plane-based one, but the Spitzer Space Telescope is a orbiting um, telescope, as the name implies, space telescope, just like the Hubble Space Telescope. These are telescopes that are satellites. So they're in orbit around Earth. Okay, there are, there are a few of them. Hubble is the most famous of the visible spectrum telescopes that's in orbit, but the Spitzer Telescope taking infrared images, artificially colored, but showing important phenomenon, primarily inside nebula. All right, so if we really, the infrared as, as a form of observational astronomy is so important for understanding what happens inside of nebula because it lets us see inside of otherwise obscured dark clouds in space. And what happens inside of nebula? That's where stars are born. That's where primordial solar systems are being created. A lot of interesting science to, to, um, you know, to carry out there. Um, here we have the Hubble, right? We talked about the Hubble at the beginning of these slides. Here is actually an image um, taken by the Hubble. This is one of its famous ultra deep field images where a tiny, tiny section of the sky was, is very carefully resolved over a long period of time. And the telescope is, is corrected because of course the telescope is moving, right? But if it takes that same image over and over again, continuing to collect more light, and then a computer collects all that data, we're able to see many galaxies, right? In this one tiny section of the sky. And it's an image like this that allows us to make an estimate that there are a hundred billion galaxies in the universe, all right? Because if there are this many galaxies in one small section of the sky, we can extrapolate that there are that many galaxies in any small section of the sky. And of course, we've taken more than just one. And then we can say that there are that many galaxies out there, a hundred billion galaxies, each with about a hundred billion stars per galaxy. Right? That's a, those are the kind, type of mind-boggling numbers that an amazing space-based telescope like the Hubble can let us get a window into. All right? Now, finally, the X-ray telescope. The, uh, one, the most famous of the space-based um, X-ray telescopes is the Chandra X-ray satellite. Um, building an X-ray telescope uses many of the same principles. There is some sort of lens to focus the, the, that type of particular EM um, radiation. In this case, it's X-rays. X-rays, unlike radio waves, have a very short wavelength. They're also very high energy. So whereas radio waves, you can build a, a mirror that just looks like a, you know, a bunch of cables you know, on a very large scale. It doesn't have to be that precisely built. It just has to be large. X-rays are the opposite engineering trouble. X-rays, X-ray focusing lenses can be tiny, so they're, you don't have to worry about you know, supporting them or you know, them collapsing or anything, but they have to be so carefully made, and they have to be able to withstand very high energy and not heat up due to the impact of X-rays. So the idea of actually resolving images of X-rays is, is an engineering marvel that's only been possible the last 20 or 30 years. 
but now we have X-ray um, telescopes. There, there are no ground-based X-ray telescopes because no X-rays, as we discussed in Chapter 5, actually pass through our atmosphere. So X-rays are, in order to observe them, you have to be outside of the atmosphere. All right. Unlike you know, some radio waves pass down, many radio waves pa pass through our atmosphere. Some infrared passes through our atmosphere, some ultraviolet, but no X-rays. Okay. So all X-rays must be observed in space. All right. Now, Hubble telescope has been a game changer in terms of science communication. It's you know, kind of well known even outside of astronomy, but there's a new telescope that's gonna be launched later this year in 2021, which is the James Webb Telescope. This is going to be the new next level telescope. It's gonna be a huge telescope, as we can see here. It's built on that principle of having large reflecting mirrors that are hexes that are gonna be carefully, carefully come together. It's actually going to sort of build itself in space. It's gonna it's sort of come, um, with all of these these hexes you know, bent in a certain way, and then they're going to be um, come out on robotic arms, and then sort of click together once it's once it's um, come to its its permanent location. It's actually going to orbit on the far side of the moon, so it's going to orbit Earth, but it's going to with the gravitational pull of moon uh, gravitational pull of the moon balancing it, so it will always be on the far side of the moon, so much much further. Um, it's that the good point of having it on the far side of the moon is it's going to be protected from any light that's coming from Earth or reflecting off of Earth. And it's going to just allow us to observe the uh, early galaxies, understand what, what primordial galaxies were like. It's going to allow us to observe exoplanets, which are planets from other solar systems, in a way that no telescope has until this telescope will become operational in the next few years. So really next level science here. Exciting, exciting point in terms of in terms of our ability to observe fine, fine details, light years away, thousands, millions, even billions of light years away. There are also plans for building huge ground-based telescopes because, although, for example, X-rays can only be observed in space, there are plenty of things we can do here on the surface of Earth. We can build better and often bigger telescopes as our engineering abilities improve. And there are plans to build the European Extremely Large Telescope. You guessed it, in Chile, right? Because that, that's just, they kind of get in what, probably the most go-to place, the, those high Atacama deserts um, in Chile. And this, this telescope has a, um, a diameter of 39.3 meters, so about 100 feet across, actually more than 100 feet across, an unbelievably large mirror, not completed. But again, having it based on you know, the surface allows for a lot, a lot more than we can you know, do in space on one hand. There's pros and cons to both. Right. So we have, you know, just a lot of money going to these telescopes, certainly. But if you think of it as a waste of money, you have to realize this is, you know, less than 0.1 percent of, you know, the global economy. And think about the fundamental questions that can be answered by these incredible, incredible engineering marvels. All right. And with that, I um, will bring this lecture on astronomical instruments to a close. I hope it has been both interesting and informative. Thank you so much for watching.